Number 10, Vanisher. An old school villain who also almost single handedly defeated the X Men back in the day. Almost. So close. Well, actually, he kind of did defeat the X Men team, but fortunately, Professor X butt in to save the day. And he was only able to defeat Vanisher by wiping his mind and making him forget who he was and what he was capable of. Which I think goes to show just how powerful of a villain he is. He was the first teleporter the team really encountered, proving just how crazy powerful teleporters are. Vanisher is also considered to be a a super fast teleporter, and his power limits thus far has been pretty much undefined, even when he did resurface years later. I would consider him to be at a higher level though, just based on what I've seen thus far. He also was able to teleport himself safely just instinctually, even when teleporting to a place he's never seen or been to before, avoiding teleporting partially or fully into any solid objects, which of course could kill him, and which is like a great danger if you're a teleporter. <laughs> you just teleport somewhere and now part of you's in a car and you're like, well, I guess I'm I'm dead now. That's it. Number nine, Living Diamond. Okay, so someone I also think we need to talk about who needs some kind of redemption in the comics is Jack Winters, aka Jack O Diamonds or Living Diamond. He was one of the first X Men villains whom Professor X saved Scott Summers from, thereby recruiting him to his X Men team. Living Diamond's mutant power was believed to be radiation resistance, but he was also shown to be able to teleport short distances, had telepathy, and had a diamond. Form. Does that sound familiar at all? Telepathy with a diamond form. Hmm. Somehow, Living Diamond was way too easily defeated by a vibration beam which shattered him. I know Living Diamond is dead now and was undead at one point, but I really feel like considering how OP Emma Frost has become, Living Diamond should also get a second chance to prove just how powerful he, in theory, should be. I mean, if you got all that, how were you so easily defeated? And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more lists like it where we talk talk about the unexpected yet powerful villains that we don't usually get to talk about, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 8, Arcade. Arcade is one of those villains who feels super ridiculous with his grandiose plans for Murder World, but in reality when he actually manages to achieve plots like Murder World, he's actually quite scary. I mean getting a sneak peek into just what a ludicrous and horrifying operation he'd run in Hellions really made me appreciate just how dangerous Arcade can be if he does manage to get enough hostages, that is, to control people into working with him so he can create his murder world. In Hellions number 9, it's revealed that the trap Mastermind walked the Hellions and prior to that Mr. Sinister into was a trap laid by Arcade himself. <gasps> Gasp, what a reveal. Arcade's plan was to use Sinister's Hellions as leverage to encourage Sinister to work for him. Sinister didn't really seem to actually care about the Hellions and he basically just agreed outright, although Arcade still chose to forcefully remove some of his teeth for fun before putting him to work. Work. He wanted Sinister to make clones for him for Murder World, and had his plan worked, it would have been a real horror show. However, Sinister made a counteroffer to Mastermind, and instead the two double crossed Arcade. Still, that whole like three issue arc made me believe in the power of Arcade. Like, if he has the right allies, he could be really crazy. I'm here for like some sort of plot where Arcade tries to just turn the world into murder world or something. I, if that hasn't happened yet, someone write that for me, please. Maybe I should write that down. Maybe I should write that. I don't know. Marvel, call me. I got ideas, apparently. Number seven, The Blob. The Blob is a villain that we don't often get to talk about on these supervillain lists. He tends to fall by the wayside, but truly, he's pretty unstoppable. And when he puts his mind to something, or when he puts his body to something, he's a terribly tough villain to defend feet or even move. The Blob was one of the first villains to appear in the original X-Men series, and when he did, he gave the team of youngsters a really tough time. He also attacked them with a circus. The Blob actually didn't start out as a villain, but became one due to the influence of Professor X and the X-Men themselves. Also just thinking back and like the amount of times that the X-Men have fought circuses or been trapped in circuses or that happens a lot. That's like a recurring theme. Initially, the X-Men attempted to recruit the Blob, but after the Blob refused to accept their offer, he managed to escape before Xavier could wipe his mind of their identities. This caused problems later on down the road, but really it was how the X-Men treated him after he refused to join and kind of his own self-esteem and then later his overcompensating sense of superiority that turned him into a villain. I like I wonder if the Blob actually could have been an ally if this whole scenario had just gone a little bit differently. The Blob is super strong, durable, and virtually immovable thanks to his ability to manipulate gravitational mass. 
which is pretty powerful. He also later gained a secondary mutation, which gave him a liquid form, but he hasn't really exhibited a ton of control with this secondary power set. But he also has liquid form. That's on the resume of powers now. Number six, Red Death. Also known as Kandra, Red Death currently has a very Scarlet Witch looking vibe going on, and I gotta say, I'm feeling it. And just like Scarlet Witch, she is not someone who you should underestimate. Kandra is part of the externals, and while she isn't one of the most memorable of that mutant villain team, she's still someone who is super powerful. Technically, just being an external comes with a pretty big dose of power. The externals, not to be confused with Marvel's Eternals, a different team entirely, are a group of immortal mutants, basically. They have had various roles throughout history. One more prominent one that folks might remember Kandra from is her role as benefactress. When we learned of her history with Gambit and the Thieves and Assassins guilds of New Orleans during Gambit's miniseries. In fact, that was actually where Kandra first was introduced in the comics, making her initial appearance in Gambit issue number one from the 1993 miniseries. Although the way they approach that introduction, you wouldn't necessarily maybe know that that was her first appearance because she kind of shows up like, hey, you know me, I'm Kandra. And I'm like, do we know you? Who are you? But it's all right, she's pretty powerful. Number five, Moira X. Moira was at one point powerful enough to have almost successfully wiped out all mutants. If it weren't for Mystique and Destiny, she would have succeeded. Even though she claimed during that past life that she only intended to create a cure to offer it to those who wanted it, Destiny knew that any mutant cure would essentially become weaponized and then forced on mutants, regardless of their own wants and desires. For those who haven't been reading along recently with the event of the current X-Men line of comics, it was revealed that Moira herself was actually a mutant whose powers were basically reincarnation in her own form. Basically, she dies and then she comes back to life as like a baby and lives her life again. But when Moira dies, she ends up being reborn as herself, but with all the memories of that past life. As such, Moira wasn't just a dangerous potential villain for the X-Men, but kind of the whole of 616, which also seems to be tied to Moira's current life, which I believe is her 10th life. Pretty crazy stuff. Moira is no longer a mutant after being cured in the 2021 Inferno series when Mystique shot her with a gun of Forge's design, which basically turns mutants into humans. But she still is a dangerous woman with a lot of information. And it was heavily implied that the creation of Krokoa was kind of all about eventually ridding the world of mutants over time, with Krokoa being like their last hurrah in terms of Moira's plan. Time will tell if Moira becomes more villainous, but I wouldn't be surprised if she did, just based on where she was heading in this story. And when or if that does happen, you better watch out. Danger is the Danger Room. The Danger Room is a villain who surfaced because they were basically being mistreated by Professor Rex, who had decided to ignore the fact that the training room had become sentient and was itself a technologically based mutant. Eventually, Danger decided, enough of this sh it's time to get some sweet, sweet revenge. The crazy thing about Danger is although we don't think of her too much, she really would be a pretty strong opponent to the X-Men considering she trained them and as such would know their strengths and weaknesses. In fact, I think that even is mentioned in the comics at one point. She was also considered to be an extinction level threat that caused Steve Rogers great worry in Heroic Age X-Men, which is kind of like a glimpse into his like tactical commentary diary. So if you wanted to read that, it exists. So despite not thinking about Danger too much, we all probably should in case she ever decides to, you know, go the villain route again. Destroy everyone, because she could probably do that. Extinction level, friends. Number three, Mystique. Mystique is someone who isn't particularly or at least outwardly powerful when it comes to what she's capable of or her power set. And for this reason, many people have taken to underestimating her abilities. Here's why we'd advise against that. Inferno, issue number four. In the newest Inferno series, it's for revealed that while Mystique tried to play by Krakoa's rules, when she learned she wasn't going to get what she wanted from Magneto and Professor Rex, no matter what she did in the name of the mutant nation, she decided to take matters into her own hands. As Mystique so often does, disguising herself as many different people, she was able to easily ensure that Destiny was resurrected, against the wishes of the heads of the Quiet Council. She also put into motion plans to make sure that Destiny would garner a spot on the Quiet Council. And then, she almost was successful in enacting revenge on Moira X for keeping her love, Destiny, from her. Mystique here proves that not only is her power set OP, but really that her mind and sense of cunning is what makes 
are so dangerous and definitely not someone to be underestimated. Number two, Destiny. Destiny has to be one of the most underestimated villains in recent years in comics. We have seen her resurface as a considerably dangerous villain in the current X books, and I'm personally loving it. Destiny was dead for quite a few years and actually got to mostly stay dead for much of them. Her mutant power allows her to see potential futures. She can see things that might come to pass, and it seems as though the more likely the future becomes, the clearer her vision of it is. She can also see more immediate futures when in the middle of a conflict. It was because of this power and Moira's personal grudge against and fear of destiny that she remained unresurrected. But something you really shouldn't underestimate when it comes to destiny is the power of love. Mystique was already told by destiny before her death that if there came a time when mutants could be resurrected and they refused to bring her back, that Mystique should basically burn this new world to the ground. And Mystique's love of destiny gave her the motivation to basically bring Krakoa to its knees with her machinations to not only return destiny, but also put her in a position of power. Precogs and love are a powerful mix. Number one, Madeline Pryor. Of course, I have to include the Goblin Queen. Madeline Pryor is a woman who seems to easily be forgotten and shelved, which is surprising considering how great of a threat she posed in the original Inferno event. Currently in the comics, Madeline Pryor is making a comeback, returning at the end of the Hellion series after being killed as part of the comic's first arc. The Madeline Pryor that was killed was definitely feeling pretty evil and threatened to destroy the entire Hellions team before they even started. The returning Madeline, who has been resurrected by the Five, is at least putting on appearances that she's more level-headed. But in reality, it seems the dark side of her still bubbles just beneath. Madeline Pryor has threatened the entire world with her dark rituals and demon packs before, and she's a clone of Jean. So although she often gets forgotten and downplayed, she really shouldn't be considering just how dangerous and powerful she is because Jean is also that and Maddie is also that too. She has the potential at least. Often people try to downplay Maddie because she's a sinister created clone, but that feels very unfair to me. She's also got like a spark of the Phoenix Force in her, so should that count for something? I think so. Number 10, Orcus. Orcus is by far one of the most important newest X-Men villainist groups that you need to know. If there is anything you take away from this list, this team should be one of them. Orcus is basically the group trying to do such dastardly things as create the mother mold so that they have an endless supply of sentinels to help defend humanity against the ever-growing threat of mutants. Orcus is also surprisingly made up and funded by other organizations, some of which are more villainous in terms of their heritage, while others are actually known for being more heroic instead. Orcus made their first appearance early on in House of X issue number one back in 2019. They were created by Jonathan Hickman and Pepe Larraz. Number nine, Horticulture. One of my all-time favorite new villainous groups to hit the scene. Horticulture is a team of extremely scientific botanists who made the decision to revolt against the corporations that they worked for. Their members also just so happen to be elderly ladies. <laughs> their plan is to reclaim the earth and revive it as it is dying because of the very industries that they worked in. They aim to take control of plant life so that they can decide who gets fed and who gets dead, controlling the world through the food supply, basically. They also have big beef with the X-Men. Horticulture made their first appearance in the 2019 X-Men series in issue number three. Horticulture was created by Jonathan Hickman and Lennel Francis Yu. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want to support us in other ways, be sure to head on over to our Facebook page and click that like. It really does help us out. Like, follow, I think it's like click like. Number eight, Pale Girl. The Pale Girl was one of the first villains we'd come up against in the current newest run of Wolverine. That is volume seven overall of the Wolverine series, the 2020 series, what I'm talking about here. I can't believe it's been over two years since this series started. That is madness to me. The Pale Lady was initially believed to be a hallucination brought on by drugs, but was later revealed to be herself a mutant, Meredith Millie, whose powers allowed her to control the minds of others. It was also revealed that she was the one behind the flower cartel, which was illegally transporting and selling a powerful drug made from the pollen of Krokoan flowers. The Pale Girl first made her appearance in the 2020 Wolverine series in issue number one. She was created by Benjamin Percy and Adam Kubert. Number seven, Hominis Verendi. Hominis Verendi are an enemy to all mutants, but their main beef lies with the Marauders. The Marauders are one of my favorite mutant teams, especially among the new books that we've had. Honestly, one of the best books around, I think, just in general. If you haven't read Marauders yet, you need to do that. 
Hum and his verandai is actually made up of a group of kids who were once members of the Hellfire Club's inner circle. But they aren't the only ones to join the Hum and his verandai, although they are the main folks as they pretty much run it as the kings and queens of that organization. Well, the Hellfire Club itself has become much more altruistic and is now run by Emma Frost, Captain Kate, formerly known primarily as Kitty Pride, and Sebastian Shaw. Hum and his verandai is like their evil reflection. They seek to destroy mutant kind and Krakoa's reputation. Number six, Swordbearers of Arako. The Swordbearers of Arako were the chosen sword bearing champions who fought on the side of Arako and Amenth against Krakoa in the Otherworld tournaments. Overall, they performed very well in the contest between those two nations, even considering how bizarre some of Saturnine's challenges and competitions were like a fashion show. That was a thing that happened. They were led by Genesis as Annihilation and joined by Bay the Blood Moon, Death and War of the original Four Horsemen, Apocalypse and Genesis' children, Iska the Unbeaten, Genesis' sister, Pog Urpog, one of my favorites, Red Root the Forest, Solemn, Summoner, grandson to Apocalypse and Genesis, the son of War, and White Sword of the Ivory Spire. They made their first appearance in the 2020 Wolverine series in issue number six, and were first referred to in Ten of Swords creation issue number one. The group was created by Jonathan Hickman and Tinny Howard. Number five, Tarn the Uncaring. Tarn has been a major antagonist throughout the modern X books. Honestly, he's so terrifying, I think he deserves to be a villain to many different mutant supers. He's shown up in both Hellions, acting as a villain against fellow villain, who's still kind of villainous, but is supposed to be on the good side, Mr. Sinister, and his team of unlikely heroes, the Hellions. The poor, poor Hellions. I miss them. Tarn also fought against Storm, who has become regent of planet Araco, formerly known as Mars. Don't worry though, Storm beat him in combat. Storm's a badass. Even though Tarn sits on the great ring of Araco, their governing body, he still seems like he's always planning something terrible. He's basically like the Araco version of Sinister, which makes him infinitely more dangerous and overall worse. Tarn made his first appearance in the Hellions issue number 6 in 2020 and was created by Zeb Wells and Carmen Carnero. Number 4, Nameless the Shapeshifter Queen. Well, this villain was pretty short lived, especially considering how hype she seemed. I mean, she is called the Shapeshifter Queen. She is still a pretty important villain for you to be familiar with if you are a fan of X Men Storm. Storm has been doing a lot of cool stuff lately in the comics, but one of the most epic things to have come her way has been taking her seat as Regent of Planet Araco and becoming a queen in a sense once more. Region. Sorry, Storm. <laughs> in order for her to earn her seat among the rest of the great ring of Araco, she had to take down Nameless. The two fought to determine if Storm would take the seat, and Storm actually won the fight. She offered mercy to Nameless, but instead, the shapeshifter queen decided to use Storm's power, as she had adopted Storm's form in battle, to end her own life. Which seems to have stuck with Storm, who was caught lost in thought thinking back to that battle in X Men Red issue number one. Nameless made her first appearance in the 2021 sword series in issue number 8. She was created by Al Ewing and Goyo Villanova. Number 3, Severe Blackmore. Severe Blackmore is a new villain who recently appeared in Wolverine. He becomes an enemy to Logan after Wolverine tracks him down to learn more about Solemn. Solemn is believed to have stolen Wolverine's Muramasa blade, which is why Wolverine's trying to track him down. Wolverine and Solemn seemingly team up to take down Severe, but instead, Solemn betrays Wolverine, giving him the slip and leaving him to face Severe alone. Fortunately, Wolverine does beat the big Iraqi pirate and even gains possession of Blackmore's beloved and, in Emma's opinion, grotesque ship. Sevier made his first appearance in the 2020 Wolverine series in issue number 14. He was created by Benjamin Percy and Adam Kubert. Number 2, Moira X. While Moira McTaggart has been known for years as an ally to mutant kind, the whole line of X books kind of changed the way that we see her. Way back in the days of Dawn of X, within House of X, we learned that Moira was actually a secret mutant herself. Her powers allowed her to reincarnate, meaning after she died, she would be born in the same body again getting to live out her life once more with the knowledge of the previous lives that she'd lived before that. Moira, upon learning she was a mutant in one of her past lives, sought a cure for her condition, wanting to be normal and to give that option to other mutants the world over that maybe, you know, just wanted to be normal. However, Destiny and Mystique stopped her, blowing up her lab and killing her with fire, warning Moira that creating a cure wouldn't be so easy and that she was naive to think that it would only be offered to those who wanted it. As such, Moira made other more discreet plans for how to kinda 
end mutant kind because she didn't really like it, even though she kind of pretended to like it. By building a paradise for the mutants, that was her plan. She orchestrated this in her current life with her overall objective kind of being to separate mutants and create the perfect society where they could mm, slowly die out. When Destiny returned, however, she and Mystique saw right through Moira and revealed that she was still, just as ever, an enemy to mutant kind. So despite the fact that Moira is an older character, this revelation of her being a potential antagonist for mutants was pretty new. These revelations came to light in the Inferno series in 2022. Number 1. Albert Carey Albert Carey is one of the newest villains on the scene and has recently made his first appearance in the X-Force 2022 annual. Here he appears as a scientist working for Orcus. That's right, it all comes back to Orcus in the end, baby. While we don't know too much about him as he just made his first appearance, he did go up against Wolverine, Domino, and Quentin Quire's Kid Omega. His plan was to do a short burst of tests on the captured mutants after luring them into a trap. He planned on them dying during said tests, but on keeping the data of said tests to learn from, basically. While well, they stole the motherboard, which stored information for the potential devices and stratagems they were testing, Albert Carey, who seemingly ran the test, is confident that with time, they can actually rebuild what they lost, and more vital, they now actually have more information, which opens up new knowledge and possible future questions and experimentation as a result. We don't really fully know what he's up to, but he seems to be testing a new weapon, and from what we've seen of Orcus, you can bet that this is likely just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to what Carey and Orcus will have in store. I'm sure we will see him again. We'll definitely see Orcus again, that's for sure. Coming in number 10, Deadpool. Deadpool kills the Marvel Universe, what a ride. This issue was released August 2012 and just the front cover is bloody goodness. What happened here was the X-Men put Wade into the Ravencroft Asylum in attempts to heal his insanity. The doctor just happened to be Psycho Man of course, so he brainwashed Wade with plans to shut down all of his inner voices, which worked, but now these voices were replaced with voices that were encouraging him to, well, kill everybody in the Marvel Universe. Reed then gets left all rubbery and lifeless and it's pretty dark overall. As far as X-Men villains go, this version of Wade was made a tad more intimidating than X-Men Origins Wolverine, just a tad. Coming number 9, Storm. Aurora Monroe made her debut in Giant Size X-Men issue number 1. She's one of the more popular members of the X-Men, being portrayed by Halle Berry and Alexander Shipp. She was recruited by Charles and joined the team to save other original students from Krakoa. She was appointed leader after several years of work. In X-Men Apocalypse, we see her recruited as a horseman, but by the end of the movie, she betrays him and joins the X-Men. But as far as powerful X-Men, X-Men villains, I can't not look for a reason to include Storm. She's Omega, and when she's on the wrong side of the fight, it can get messy. Coming to number 8, Wolverine. Wolverine has a rough past, so it's no surprise that he's gone down a few dark paths as well. In the movie Logan, for example, we see two Wolverines battle it out, and it's stressful, it's gory, and it's very upsetting the most. But I mean, that's Wolverine's going at it, so it sounds about right. In the Age of Apocalypse storyline, Logan goes from being an X-Men to the Horseman of Death. Yeah, Apocalypse actually had Wolverine go against Sabretooth in order to see who would become the new horseman. Wolverine came out on top and Apocalypse restored the adamantium to his skeleton. Quite the deal if you ask me. To make matters worse, Apocalypse replaced Wolverine with a scroll so the X-Men wouldn't even notice. So there's a few comics here that could blend nicely into the MCU, like Apocalypse replacing Wolverine with a scroll. that is totally possible. With Ryan Reynolds confirming the next Deadpool would have included Logan, I doubt there isn't some sort of that coming with him for Deadpool 3. They're basically best friends in real life. Adam Sandler has like 14 of his his friends every movie, so I'm holding out hope for Logan. Coming in number 7, Juggernaut. K. Marco made his first comic book appearance in X-Men issue 12. When Kane and Charles Xavier were serving together in the same unit, but when Kane was under fire, he ran off to take cover in a nearby cave. The cave was actually home to the Lost Temple of Sidorak. So Kane grabbed this glowing ruby from the lap of an idol, read the inscription, and possessed the power of the Crimson Bands of Sidorak, becoming a literal human Juggernaut. After he dug himself out, he destroyed an entire village, with the previous man who held the Juggernaut mantle, Jin Taiko, getting taken taken out as well. We've literally seen him rip Deadpool in half, and if he's coming over to the MCU, I hope Juggernaut will as well. Coming to number 6, Strife. Making his debut in New Mutants issue number 87, Strife was the clone of Nathan Summers, the son of Cyclops, and Madeline Pryor. He's a clone of Cable from the future, he has this high tech armor, he's a telepathic and telekinetic mutant, and unlike Cable who has to devote his psionic powers to ensure this techno organic virus doesn't get his right side as well, Strife doesn't need to worry about that issue. Apocalypse wanted this child, he wanted to raise the clone himself. So down the road he could one 
one day claim the body as his own. Coming to number 5, Shadow King. Making his first appearance in X-Men 117, the Shadow King is a multiversal manifestation of the dark side of the human consciousness, spawned by the first nightmare. Amal Farouk was the leader of the underground syndicate located in the thieves quarter of Cairo, Egypt. He's a powerful mutant who also happened to be a vessel for said Shadow King. Farouk was able to control everybody around him and it's pretty terrifying when you think about it. He feeds on the shadows of your soul so yeah with Marvel now veering off to the cosmic side of things we could see a Shadow King whenever the X-Men come into the picture. In the comics before World War II, Amal Farouk worked with Baron Von Strucker to try and destabilize Britain's political structure. Even more terrifying. Coming in number 4, Mr. Sinister. Dr. Nathaniel Essex made his first debut in Uncanny X-Men 221. He's not that easy to forget though once you take a look at him. He's kind of terrifying, well to say the least. He's obsessed with experimenting on mutants and yes that includes himself. He was obsessed with Darwin's theory of evolution but felt like they were shackled by too many moral constraints. He couldn't even get funding from the Hellfire Club so he had to get together a group that he named the Marauders and got them to kidnap people off of the streets of London so that he could continue his experiments. Guy is pretty twisted when you think about it. He even tried to experiment on his own son who just happened to be no longer alive. A villain who resurrects the dead? I mean the MCU could probably use that right about now. Cubby number 3, Mojo. Making his first debut in Longshot issue number 3, Mojo is known for using Earth as forms of TV entertainment for the universe. We're getting close to these cosmic vibes with Loki's show on Disney Plus so I don't think a live action Mojo is far fetched. The more viewers he gets for his interdimensional TV show, the more powerful that he becomes. So in 1992, the issue titled Mojo's Media Madness had this wild storyline where Mojo gets Rogue, Cyclops, Beast and Wolverine to think that they are characters from The Wizard of Oz. I would sell my my soul to see this show. I mean, but for now, the comic will have to do. This takes place in X Men issue number 10. Mojo is a unique villain. He's part of a race of spineless beings from a planet named after him called Mojo World, inside a pocket dimension called the Mojo Verse. So, this race of spineless beings were slowly going crazy over time because TV signals from another space time continuum were scattered into their timelines. He's a powerful sorcerer, and we're not exactly sure just how far his magic can go. And I don't really want to find out. To be honest. Coming in number two, Onslaught. Making his first debut in X Men issue number 15, Onslaught was a sentient psionic entity created from the minds of Charles Xavier and Magneto. That's pretty messed up. So when the X-Men were finding the Acolytes, Wolverine hit Magneto and then in return Magneto ripped the adamantium from his bones which, uh, gotta say, I thought hangnails were bad. This sounds like an absolute nightmare. His healing factor had to work overtime for sure. Xavier shut down Magneto's mind which made him catatonic. But during this moment all of Magneto's lust for hate and violence leaked into Charles consciousness creating this new personality called Onslaught. He now obtained the ability to tap into the psychic resources of the astral plane where he could then manipulate matter and energy. There's also a red onslaught, but I'll save that for another time. Last but certainly not least, our number one spot, Apocalypse. And Sabat Noor making his first steps in Marvel graphic novel issue number 17 was born nearly 5,000 years ago at the edge of the Valley of the Kings in ancient Egypt. He was abandoned by his tribe because of the fact that he looked, well, different. He had the Avatar look going on. It, you know, for lack of a better explanation. He later was raised by the nomads with the idea that only the strong survive, a tough way for a child to think and live. He actually was killed by agents of Ozymandias but was later revived thanks to his mutant abilities. For example, his self molecular manipulation allows for him to alter his physical form and he's also a genius. Even before being modified by the celestial ship, Apocalypse was already living for thousands of years. All he has to do is enter a deep sleep. In the X-Men Apocalypse storyline we see just how big and bad the guy can get though. Number 10, Nanny. First on our list today is the partner of the Orphan Maker, Nanny, a low level telepath that paired up with the Orphan Maker as the two thought that the parents of mutant children were just straight up evil and ill equipped to properly raise and protect their young mutants from danger. She and Orphan Maker travel the world searching for young mutants to take care of, killing their parents to sever any family connections, and using her minor telepathic powers to control her new charges. Dubbed the Lost Boys and Lost Girls, these mutant orphans acted as her quote unquote new children. Her first major mission was at the state home of Foundlings in Omaha, a facility where Mr. Sinister kept many mutant children for observation and experimentation, and she was able to liberate them after escaping the grasp of the X-Men. Fast forward a bit and we see Nanny and the Orphan Maker attack the X-Men in Australia in order to quote unquote save them, however this led them to being overpowered and forced to flee to see another day. During the events of M-Day just after Decimation, we see Nanny resurface once more only to be defeated by Wolverine himself. Give her story a read for yourself starting with her first appearance in 1988's X-Factor, number 30. 
Number 9. Tusk Not a whole lot is known about the early life of this inhuman, and honestly not knowing how he turned out to be like this makes him just that little bit more terrifying. Tusk has the ability to grow in power and in size into this monstrous form, as well as the power to produce smaller versions of himself that can act independently thanks to a psychic link. Tusk served Apocalypse as one of the original recruits of the Riders of the Storm, which lasted for quite some time until Strife overpowered Apocalypse and the Riders served under him. Fast forward just a tad and we see the Dark Riders return when a lot of the mutant population began dying thanks to the effects of the Terrigen Mist. They went on a bit of a killing spree getting rid of any mutant healer, believing that their powers were a violation of the natural order. And the reasoning behind that was that mutants had had their chance at survival and that delaying their extinction was not the way to go about it. This caught the attention of Magneto and his X-Men and the team set out to take down the Riders, succeeding after Magneto overpowered them and finished them off for good with some good old explosives. Check out Tusk's story starting the 1991's X-Factor number 65. Number 8, Bulwark. Oswald Boglin was another X-Men villain that we don't know a whole lot about, especially when it comes to their backstory, but I mean, hey, that's not the worst thing. It lets us speculate, and I, for one, love that. Bulwark had the ability to expand his muscle mass to unknown proportions, increasing his strength, durability, and resistance. He also wore these red leather bands all across his face and body, and it's assumed that this was done as a means of self-restraint to gauge the safe limit of his powers, as they would start to get a little bit tighter the bigger that he got. He was recruited by Emplet to join their team and torment Generation X, and that's honestly exactly what they did. The Hellions were successful in capturing the young mutants, but M had telepathically called for help, and it was answered by X-Men Bishop. M then took out all her frustrations on Bulwark, punching him through the school's biosphere, and then flying right after him. As he was about to attack M back, his muscles started to wither away, and knowing that he was defeated, he fled so that he could fight another day. Like many villains, Bulwark did not get a happy ending, as he was eventually captured by the revamped Weapon X program, and was unfortunately killed. Give his story reads starting with 1996's Generation X, number 12. Number 7, Spoor. Andrew Graves developed his unique mutation at a pretty young age. Now what was that mutation you ask? Well for starters he had a very animal like appearance, kind of like Bigfoot. But that's not all because his real ability was that he was able to control people's moods and actions through pheromones. Growing up with an abusive father who forced his mother to kill herself, Andrew grew up with an intense hatred for humans and began using his powers to make others turn on each other and kill each other. He eventually adopted the name Spoor and became a member of the Acolytes and as a member of the team countless civilians and innocent people lost their lives. For a time, he was a prisoner of Excalibur as Dr. Rory Campbell wanted to cure Spore, but during the treatment, Rory's latent hatred of mutants got the better of him, and Spore manipulated Rory into an aggressive attack on him, which gave him the opportunity to escape. Sadly, though, this escape wasn't permanent as he eventually made his way back onto the island and was killed during a sentinel attack. It was revealed later that Spore's motives for killing were a lot darker and sadder than we originally thought, though. Spore just hated himself as much as other humans, and in his mind felt that killing humans was very wrong and that he, therefore, deserved to be killed himself. Check them out for yourself starting with 1993's Uncanny X-Men number 300. Number 6, Barrage. Another one of the original recruits of the Dark Riders of the Storm on this list today. If you're not familiar with Barrage, he had the ability to transform his forearms into organic weapons capable of collecting ambient energy, and then firing it into powerful explosive blasts. Barrage served as an agent of Apocalypse and seemed to follow him no matter what the task was given, as he was a part of the attack on x Factor ship and the attack on the Inhuman City on the moon. Alongside the other members of the Dark Riders, Barrage switched sides and served under Strife after he was able to best Apocalypse, and they defended Strife's moon base from the X-Men and mortally wounded the unfit Apocalypse in combat. After Strife's death, the Riders traveled the world challenging any and all mutants, killing Mesmero and even their own Synapse in the process as they were too weak to even be considered worthy of living. Barrage was one of the few members of the Riders to survive the massacre by Wolverine because he actually wasn't a part of the team at the time. Honestly, lucky him. Fast forward a bit and the Dark Riders, including Barrage, embarked on a journey to kill mutant healers after a Terrigen mist cloud was spread throughout the world, endangering mutant kind, believing that the event was to be a test of strength so that only the strongest would survive. When they attacked the healer Shen Zorn, they were caught off guard by his display of ultimate power, which unfortunately cost Barrage his life. Check him out starting with 1991's X Factor number 65. Number 5, Whiteout. Now I'm really starting to sense a pattern here because extremely little is known about Whiteout and her past. A lot of it is just, you know, assuming and speculation. We do know what her power is though. Whiteout possesses the superhuman ability to project a flash of blinding white light from her body. This light renders her opponents blind for approximately one minute, and for some unknown reason, her power only affects victims that she chooses, and not everyone within the range, meaning it can be used very tactically. So like I said before, a lot of her past life is speculated, but it's assumed that she has resided in the Savage Land for some time 
time, and it was there that she was recruited by the mutant Zaladane to join her forces of the Savage Land mutants. In her only known mission for Zaladane, Whiteout and the other Savage Land mutants attacked the X-Men in Chile while they were looking for Polaris. The X-Men defeated the Savage Land mutates pretty easily in this battle, and Whiteout presumably just fled. Check out more of her for yourself, starting with her first appearance in 1989's Uncanny X-Men number 249. Number 4, Fever Pitch. Real name unknown, Fever Pitch was a very handsome young man until his mutant powers manifested and he accidentally destroyed his own face. Thanks to his mutant powers, his entire body is made of an organic flame that allows him to radiate intense heat, fly, and discharge and throw explosive plasma. As the years went by and his powers became stronger, he eventually burned through his entire body, leaving him nothing more but a fiery skeleton, which ultimately led him to becoming a member of the incarnation of Gene Nation, organized and led by the Dark Beast. Fever Pitch was seemingly killed on his first mission by Nate Gray after his energy was siphoned off, but he did later resurface in Berlin trying to capture Abyss so that he could sell him off to some researchers. Now skip ahead a little bit and we see Fever Pitch classified by the government as a national security threat as he was one of the few mutants to keep his powers after the decimation of the mutant population. He was one of the many mutants to have a tracking chip implanted in his head before a trip into Salem Center. When the chip's true nature was discovered, he had it removed by Mr. M, who he followed when he led an exodus from the Institute. Fever Pitch was later captured by the anti-mutant group the Safe League and was injected with a dose of the legacy virus, causing his powers to straight up overload, killing hundreds including himself. Check out his whole story starting with his first appearance all the way back in 1999's Generation X, number 50. Number 3, The Nasty Boys. Comprised of Mr. Sinister, Ruckus, Multiple Man, Slab, Gorgeous George, Hairbag, and Ramrod, the Nasty Boys were the strike force organized by Mr. Sinister to take down the X-Men. The Nasty Boys made their first appearance all together battling the X-Factor after Slab initially attacked Strong Guy. After losing this battle, Sinister posed as Steven Shafrin and unveiled his plan to kill the Scarlet Witch. Shafrin, obviously upset, attempted to kill him only to be killed himself. During all that, Ramrod was also deported from the country, but did make his way back, illegally. <laughs> Needless to say, this is a very busy group. The team was later regrouped by Sinister, and they hunted Malice, who was trying to kill Polaris, so that they couldn't re-merge, and they didn't stop this hunt until Malice was apparently destroyed by Polaris herself and Havoc. A while later, the team decided to reform during the final days of Mutant Kind, after X-Man's return that ended in the death of most of the X-Men. Now, it was revealed to be a bait set up by the upstarts to lure out the remaining X-Men, which they were not aware of, and they were all prompt killed by the upstarts. Check out these nasty, nasty boys for yourself, starting with 1992's X Factor, number 75. Number 2, Forearm. Michael McCain, aka Forearm, was one of the founding members of the Mutant Liberation Front, a team of disillusioned and rebellious mutant youth. Now, Michael is called Forearm for pretty obvious reasons, but I will explain his powers a bit for you anyways. He has four arms, hence, you know, the name. And thanks to this mutation, he also possesses superhuman strength, stamina, and durability. Now, one of their first missions under the leadership of Strife was to liberate the incarcerated New Mutants members Rusty and Skids, and the team broke them out of prison, and the pair joined the MLF out of just straight up confusion. Skip ahead a bit, and the MLF travels with Mural Island where they meant to steal the legacy virus data, but while they were there, they learned about the Xavier protocols and decided to steal them instead. The team was confronted by Excalibur though, and they were quickly teleported away empty handed. After a second attempt to steal the legacy virus, Forearm left the team as he felt betrayed by Moonstar, who revealed herself to be an undercover shield agent. He later resurfaced as a part of a fighting championship in Madripoor called Bloodsport, where superpowered opponents fought to the death. However, in an unfortunate turn of events, Forearm was killed during a fight with former Serpent Society member Anaconda, who just broke his neck. Oddly enough though, he was somehow able to recover from death and made an appearance as a member of the MLF once more not too long after. Give a story read starting with 1990's New Mutants number 86. And number one, Executioner. Now with a name like Executioner, you can probably guess what this guy is all about. Carl Denty was a field agent for the FBI whose partner Fred Duncan was a member of Charles Xavier's underground who would cache the technological equipment that the X-Men confiscated from alien races. After his partner's death, Carl inherited all of the equipment and decided that mutants had caused way too much damage in the world, so he donned a lot of the equipment and started calling himself the Executioner, beginning his quest to punish mutants who had not been legally convicted of their crimes. Starting off with killing the mutant tower, Denty quickly teleported away once the X-Men arrived on the scene to stop him, 
but he was smart and decided to teleport to the X Mansion to kill the comatose Emma Frost. However, he wasn't smart enough because he was still stopped by Cyclops and Cable. Now, none of that deterred him though because he still continues his mission of punishing mutants. However, for a while he actually did some good as he teamed up with the Punisher in Washington DC to protect the pro-mutant activist Reverend James Conover from the Mutant Liberation Front. This act landed him the position of potential recruit for the initiative, however, who knows if he was ever actually on that team because that was one of the last times we saw him. Check out his story for yourself starting with 1993's Uncanny X-Men Annual, number 1993.